Yeah. We're excited, amen, this dynamic uh, man of God, amen. Just let me give you a little background. Jay has heart founder Jabari Hall is an international empowerment speaker. He serves as the CEO of Think Positive and Dream Big and Vice President of Resident a Vice President of Re of Resident Sorry Elder Youth Engagement Corporation. Two New York City based nonprofits geared towards educating and empowering youth in local communities. He facilitates effective leadership, success and goal achieving seminars at staff development days, lunch and learns, retreats, conferences, and more. Jabari J has Heart is a subsidiary of Think Positive and Dream Big, yes. a multi-city partner and vendor, believes that it takes a village to raise a child, and that village includes the students, parents, and school leaders and teachers. Thus, when we educate and empower all three groups on the importance of consistent youth engagement, our children stand a better chance at success. They educate communities through that student-focused workshops, parent-engaging workshops, and empowership leadering seminars. I want you to show some love and put your hands together yeah. for Jabari So yes. glad to see you, Mr. Hall. Yes. It's always a blessing. Amen. You always come with a blessed word. And Amen. I thank God for you. Thank God for you being here. Amen. You could have been any other place, but thank God for you being on the Pearl Hill Show. Yes. Um, Mr. Hall, I want to start off um, asking you, what inspired you to start J Has Heart? Um, yeah, what inspired me to start uh, Jay Has Heart? Well, uh, uh, thank you so much for having me here, first of all. Um, I have Great. this paper here as my note card, uh, but um, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Um, Jay Has Heart being the organization where we focus on social and emotional learning for K-12 to students. What inspired me to start Jay Has Heart is summed up in one word, and it's, 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 it's God. Um, about 10 years ago, I... I uh, was in the um, IT industry. I was a uh, program uh, manager for an, an organization where I worked from home, and I was telling people what to do at home. Like, hey, you better do this, do this, and I'm gonna turn on the TV right here. I mean, it was an <laughs> enjoyable job, uh, making a lot of money. I took vacations every six weeks. I, I, I enjoyed myself, but for, for, for some reason, I felt like something was missing. I wasn't enjoying life the same way. I was missing a part of me. And um, on, a, on a December evening, I remember starting to ask the Lord, what is my what? What is my why? Why am I here? Um, it has to be more than just this. And it took about eight to nine months every day asking the Lord, what is my what? What is my why? Why am I still alive? And on a Tuesday morning, after I finished a, uh, a meeting, um, I got off the phone and I heard a voice. And immediately I paused, raised, and I thought someone was in the house. So I got up, I looked around, I'm like, somebody here? You know, if you thought somebody in the house, you're like, who is here? <laughs> I'm going to every room and find out who is here. And I sat back and I thought when I was younger and I would hear the elders in the church say, oh, I heard the Lord child. And I used to be like, you hear the Lord? I hear the Lord. And I was like, you know what? That is the Lord. And I remember the Lord telling me, I remember the Holy Spirit telling me, um, um, you are placed here to empower the youth. Well, wow. To empower the youth distinctly. And it's always interesting when you say, when you, when you tell yourself, listen, 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 listen for the Lord. And finally, I got my answer. In that moment, I left a quarter million job, a quarter million dollar job, left it, two week notice, here you go, and started my business, Jay Has Heart, with no other way or how to do it. I didn't get the blueprint, wow. I just got the word. And um, I felt that in my spirit. And from there, I started Jay Has Heart. And the rest is history. Wow, that's great. I Absolutely. want you to talk about how you deal with empowering 
I mean, empowering the youth. What age groups are you particularly interested in and what do you do with those particular age groups? Yes, yes. Uh, what age groups uh, do we focus on? It's truly a K to 12, when we speak about students, K to 12 um, curriculum that we um, focused on for students. Um, and we teach them about social and emotional learning, which is actually helping them on how to deal with themselves internally, how to find out who they are, um, and really express themselves to others and respect other human beings. Um, but not only do we work with young people, we work with adults as well. Adults in the home, such as guardians, and adults in the school as our leaders. And we educate them on the importance of building the whole child, how to get a child to um, be the same in the household and in the school. I know children, I teach with children, and they'll say, my mom ain't here, my daddy ain't here, I do what I want. And I want to help them understand it doesn't matter if that parent is here or not. What is your character? Who are you outside of what somebody is looking, um, uh, somebody is over you looking at? Who are you, right? It is word integrity, and we teach them about that. So um, the, the work is, is scaffolded for K to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 12, and we even speak to college students about finding out who they are. Thank you for that information. Um, you talked about what are some issues that you find that parents have? I know you help his organization help parents with credit issues right, um, right. To, to overcome that. Talk about some of those things that you do. Yeah, specifically, um, what, we found, what we've found is in particular cultures, um, particular, in particular cultures, we emphasize more things on credit or less things on credit. We understand credit or not understand credit. We use credit and don't use credit. We, we hear about credit and don't hear. All these different things happen in particular communities. And uh, without being too direct for a select community, we recognize these things and we say, okay, how do we educate you on how to use credit? How to um, evaluate credit? How to um, respect credit? credit. Um, so we teach them about ways that, and, and ways in which they, um, the things, excuse me, we teach them the things that you do, what are five things that you do that drops your credit score? What are five things that you can do to increase your credit score? What is something you could do tomorrow to increase that credit score? Now, if you now open a new credit card, how many points does your credit then um, increase in a quarter, right? Sharing and educate, educating these parents on um, how to really respect credit and use credit to their advantage. And then now, how does that help you in other spaces? How does that help you when you are now starting a business, um, going for a house, et cetera, et cetera? Um, this is the thing, these are the things that we do to help with credit specifically. Wow, that's great, that's great. Yeah. Don't touch that down. Show some love. We'll be back with yeah. you. Yeah. Jabari. after this segment. I'm just trying to get this over with. Thank you so much for joining us. We are back. We're doing our show taping, How to Get the Gospel of the Millennials to the Millennials. Sorry. Old School, New School, The New Era of Faith. Let me introduce my panel. He's a trailblazer all across the country. He is a dynamic international speaker. Mr. Jabari, founder of Jay Has Heart, Jabari Hall! And he's as millennial as our panel gets. <laughs> also, we have this dynamic minister who travels all over the world. He just came back from the Philippines not too long ago, where he ministers, and he also has a ministry that he's a part of in Jamaica, Queens. Show some love for Minister Jeffrey Rosier. Yeah. Amen, amen. Her Bible in 
Institute has inspired many people to seek Christ, and she's graduated a lot of people. Also, she has a dynamic ministry. Show some love for Dr. Apostle Stephanie Roberts. Yeah. 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 He's a dynamic scholar in the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, educator, man of God, Amen. who has an inspiring word. And he's traveled all across New York City and around the world proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. His unique blend is a dynamic, he has a dynamic word. I want you to show some love for Bishop Dr. Atkins! Yeah. Great to have you all here. My first question to you is, what are some differences between ministry in the old school and ministry in the new school? We'll start off with you, Apostle. Loaded question. Wow. What is the difference between ministry in the old school and ministry in the new school? I would say the number one difference is traditions. Traditions. And culture. Those two things play a major part in the difference between old school and new school. The traditions uh, the new school generation thinks it's stifling or is outdated or it don't take all of that. Um, uh, like was said uh, a moment ago or in an earlier segment, um, they're inflexible. There's no flexibility with the times of the change that uh, the newer school uh, people are growing up in. Um, and culture plays a major part in it as well. Uh, the culture in different ministries is different. So um, when you have someone like a millennial that's going from one church to another trying to season themselves as to where they may want to worship, it's so different, it's bringing confusion mm. to them. Like they do it this way across the street and over that way. They do it across the street, but that church over there, they do the Macarena, but this church over here, let you wear jeans. <laughs> so it, it, it's confusing to them. So <laughs> he's laughing. Um, so they're not sure where God is in. It, if I can say that. Great. Um, Let's go all the way back. Old school was a follow me ministry with, with God. Then it began to change. Jesus came into the picture. It began to change just a bit because he showed the practicality of what ministry was for the individual. And then you had Paul that came into the picture, the Apostle Paul, who said that we didn't have to do all the statues to love God. And now here we are in this particular time dispensation where ministry has taken a great turn when you're talking the difference between Eastern and Western culture. Mm -hmm. In the Eastern culture, it is a particular part of their traditional cultural life. In the Western culture, it is a choice. Mm -hmm. And that choice is very different because depending on where you are in the geographical area of the Western culture, mm -hmm. it is done different. You in the cities, most cities don't have time really for religion. It's part of your curriculum or your dates, details of your day or your week. Versus if you live in more rural areas as in you know, Missouri, Minnesota, or Utah, it's a little different because you have a community that's based around the church mm -hmm. versus in the city is based around business. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult, when, especially in the Western culture when you have such a diverse cultural diversity of immigrants and everything here. It changes on how you do it. Some days is Saturday, some days is Thursday, some days is Sunday, which is your day that you can have the time to worship the Lord. And then it goes even further that you only really have two particular groups, Judaism and Christianity, that has specific days. Every other group of religion has certain rituals that we no longer do. Mm -hmm. You know, prayer is one of them. Mm -hmm. We all have prayer. But then there's different ways of doing it. And you have to find which is more conducive to your lifestyle. And it, it, and it has a lot. Mm -hmm. You in the class with a, a child is in a class with Islam, and they pray five times a day. They're in the class with Judaism, they five times a day. And then your religion says you pray anywhere, wherever. Mm -hmm. So there's so much diversity that it, it is kind of difficult. But we can overcome it with time. 
Amen. If we can unify yeah. ourselves, we can come. We can overcome it. Amen. 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 Music is is one of the biggest differences between old school and new school. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. th with the pandemic, which we're not really out of yet, um, Amen. that changed uh, a lot of our in-person because older people like myself, baby boomers, we're more hands-on. We're more, uh, you know, uh, in-person, you know, more close and talking to individuals. And, you know, and, and whereas the newer generation now with the, with the pandemic, everybody's used to online church online church and it's fast it's quick you know we're in church 15 20 minutes you know sing a song you know uh, a quick 10 minute sermon and and it's it's, mm -hmm. it's 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 done and even in our church well our, our bishop he's, he's his daughter she's like the senior pastor you know now mm -hmm. and for, honestly most of the time the young people when I, when I get up to preach they don't really listen to me mm -hmm. they don't they don't listen to me they they listen to her just like they're not going to listen to me as much as they'll listen to you because we're, we're just, we're, you know, like we're not out in the pasture yet, but, you know, it's, it's just, it's different. You know, the way we do things is different. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to change, you know, just to please my granddaughter. Not many millennials will listen to old grandpas. They want to hear from some millennials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Um, amen. Um, may I hit the question again? I apologize. Certainly, sure, no problem. I was writing notes. Uh, I always just try to write notes um, of what uh, the apostle and the minister and the pastor here mentioned, and um, I think um, they answered the question. Uh, you know, I, I don't even have extra words to add to it. You know, the, the apostle mentioned um, um, it's about the culture and traditions, all right, that. that that's affecting the old and the new. Uh, the minister mentioned um, and went back into um, how the church was individual-led in, in prior um, centuries and uh, the difference in Western culture versus Eastern culture and then Western culture having a choice and all of these things, I think that certainly plays a role. And the pastor mentioned the biggest difference is music and things being hands-on and now it's a fast church. I think all of that um, adds to why adds to the difference between the old and the present, um, and you know if I if I may add something to all of that is, and I know you sir you you, you just mentioned you know not wanting to change um, for the granddaughter uh, you know and and this is why I always say you know to each his own and I understand that I I just truly believe um, that. And these differences that we see, um, like the minister mentioned, we don't have to live in this is how it's going to be. We're going to come out of this. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take people understanding that throughout the years, throughout the centuries, the, the church has manifested in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Talked about Christ coming in and Paul coming in and things like that as we progress through. We take that same premise and bring it to this current time and recognize how do we now adapt to the changes. And I get that there are some churches that are now saying uh, or now doing a church in a fast way, a kind of microwave church, uh, yeah. this microwave preaching and things like that. Um, but we have to find this kind of balance between the two. And I think once we find that perfect marriage and be willing to find that perfect marriage between the two, we can really see some progress in unifying the old and the new and kind of making, or the old and the present, and making a new style the way it's been all along. Um, um, so it's really finding finding out, even if we're worshiping in different ways, we're listening to different music. Um, um, you said Macarena and something else um, <laughs> over here. When I, even if we're doing it in different ways, but really accepting that <laughs> what is that macarena for? Hey, God, all right, you know. <laughs> if you're doing it for it, all right, hey, hallelujah, amen. If you're doing it something, something diff, so if you're doing yeah. it some way different over there and it's for the glory of God, hallelujah. And if we unify in that way, we really can find this perfect marriage of everyone in their own unique way, praising God um, 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 for, for His glory. Yeah. And I think glory. hopefully that answers that question. Yes. Yes. Glory. Sure.
We're going to do a Q&A with Jabari Hall. Jabari, give us some examples where you've worked with a challenged youth um, who had a lot of issues or problems, and your program has helped them. That's a good question. A few years ago, I ventured off into Dallas and started to do some business in Dallas. Business, also speak with young people, yes. And came across this school where um, they enjoyed what our program was about and mentioned, yeah, we want to bring you in for a workshop. Um, um, this is a paid opportunity. Great. Um, we'll see you in about a month for this opportunity. At the same time, I was working with a school that was in an impoverished area um, where the graduation rate was about under, the, under 70 percent, 60 percent or so of students would graduate. And that school and I, we were in great partnership because I wanted to do pro bono work and really just help out that school and the students and the community there. So I came back to New York and was waiting out the month or so. And um, school A, which was the paid gig, so to speak, um, I was already set with them and, and everything. School B, uh, where I wasn't being paid for this opportunity, was they were, um, they called me and said, we have this program and it's on this date. So I told, thought to myself, okay, give me a second, let me think about what date that is. And I looked back and I saw that it was the same day that school A had me on this program. And I told school B, I said, okay, give me about a week. Let me get back to you. Let me think about this. And in that moment, who did I consult? Not Google, not friends, not family, the man above. What is it that I need to do in this moment? Do I go with the school that has already commissioned a set of money to pay for the people that I work with? Do I go with the school that, um, that I really want to work with these students and empower them, the people that look like me? And I, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought the entire week, thinking, 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 and not until the, the morning of did I get this revelation, did I get this answer after worshiping. Huh? Not even just praying, after worshiping, getting this answer, like um, um, the doctor said here. And I called school A and I said, I'm sorry to cancel on you, but I can't come. And I called back school A and I said, I'll be there. So I went to school, I called back school B and I said, I'll be there. So I went to school B. I gave a riveting, a, an exciting, an awesome presentation, of course. I mean, And there was a student in the back, way in the back. In Dallas, they had these huge schools, huge auditoriums. And a student was way in the back. And after my presentation, he came to me and he said, you know, Mr. Hall, I know some of the students weren't listening to you. I know they were making noise and not really taking in what you said, but I heard what you said. And as I'm packing up, I'm listening to this young man. And he said, you know, can I have a moment of your time? I'm, sure, sure. And he proceeds to tell me that he's, he's, a, he's a senior in this school. And his, mom, his grandmom takes care of he and his sister. And they didn't have money to take care of the family. So he was going to go to work to take care of the family because the grandma could not take care of the family. And he was praying for someone to be sent that day. And he was happy that it was me that came that day. And instantly tears welted in my eyes and I can still feel it now because in that moment he didn't know the, the, the dilemma that I had. He didn't know what I was worshiping about and saying, do I follow the money, Lord? Do I follow and think that you have this money for me? Or do I follow what I feel inside of me to inspire these young people, regardless of what money may be set for me? He didn't know that dilemma. I welted up, tears welted up in my eyes because in that moment I realized that I got my answer and there was the right answer and I was here for the right reason. And if I didn't get to, get to inspire a, a 200 young people that were in that auditorium, that one person I came for.
And the reason why I gave that story is to share with you that is the power in the program. Sometimes it's the words that you share. Sometimes it's the product in, in the program. But sometimes it's the individual. Sometimes it's a Paul or a Jacob or a David. Sometimes it's the individual, the servant or the witness that he sends to that location to inspire somebody. And that is how my program works, honestly. So wow, I give you thanks impressive. and praise. Show some love. Amen. Give it up for Jabari. Paul. We'll be back with more. Amen. positive and I was dreaming big dreaming of being this colossal sized influence in people's lives and I'm on that journey now piece by piece day by day